You are listening to Fantha Tracks. It's time to hit south with the Fanta from down under. Here's your host, Adam O'Brien. G'day, mate. How you going? This is the Fanta from down under coming to you from Quinlan's Cantina in the Gold Coast of Australia. For, of course, Fanta Tracks Radio with episode number 61, Kenobi Kenobi. That's right. Well, you can guess what we're going to be chatting about is, of course, a Disney Plus show. That's, of course, Obey One Kenobi. And that's right. It is a fantastic show, folks. And I think Disney Plus has finally found its stride with this show. We've had The Mandalorian. We've had The Book of Boba Fett. We've had many other things on Disney Plus that are worth you and your time checking out. But Disney Plus, not only with, of course, the Star Wars content that we're getting on there, you're getting Marvel and, let's just face it, some great old material as well. And we're going to be chatting about that tonight, but straight to Kenobi. You know, I certainly was one that has a certain love for the Kenobi character itself. Going back to the prequels and, of course, the original films, you know, it really was a character that was the Merlin, and you know, that we always gravitated towards. It is a mentor role. It is one that is, without a doubt, both parts, Alec Guinness and now, of course, Ewan McGregor, and, of course, James Arnold Taylor in The Clone Wars. But what is great about the character is that we're getting to see these two separate eras through the character and of course in the middle this amazing era of Kenobi where you know he's really at the lowest possible point you know he's had his best friend turn to the dark side and you know it's practically by the time we get to episode three it's his brother and it's great that we're also seeing two very good friends of course Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen reuniting you know, everyone's seeing the interviews they've been doing on uh, social media, and you can certainly see it's real. They really do have a genuine love and affection for each other. And they may not have seen each other for quite some time, but this project brought them back, and they certainly giving it their all when it comes to the series. Now, the series is set 10 years after, of course, um, the fall of the Republic to, of course, the Empire. And, of course, Sheev Palpatine carving his little way through the universe with his war machine. And, of course, in this one, we get to see the fact that we've got Obi-Wan Kenobi. Where we left him, pretty much, from Revenge of the Sith, he is on Tatooine, and he's looking over Luke Skywalker. We have Joel Edgerton returning, of course, as Alan Lars, and, of course, uh, Bonnie Pierce is in there as well, um, Baru. And what's great about this is we get to actually see a bit more actual acting between the two uh, in the first episode. Part of it is the fact that we've got the Jedi on the run and being hunted down by the Empire's Inquisitors, working for, of course, Darth Vader. And they're tasked with literally finishing off the purge that was meant to happen 10 years before. So we have the Inquisitors coming through here. We've got the Grand Inquisitor, which we know already from Star Wars Rebels. Quite an interesting character. One that was a Jedi Guardian, I think you would call him, in the actual Jedi Temple itself. Great character and certainly uh, voiced by a great actor by the name of Jason Isaacs. One of my favorites, folks. Jason Isaacs, fantastic. Easily the best thing about Star Trek Discovery, folks. Great character, and it's great to see this version of it, which is earlier in the timeline. But we also have an Inquisitor by the name of Reva, played amazingly by Moses Ingram. I think she's doing such an amazing job with this role. It's an interesting role, the fact that we're getting to see where the character comes from. You know, a strong, young, ambitious Force user who was a Jedi youngling at the time of the Purge, when, of course, Anakin Skywalker was doing his nastiest. I'm Brian Herring, BB-8 Puppet Chair, and you're listening to Fanta Tracks. That'll learn you. We've got various different running times, and of course, that's what makes this interesting how Deborah Chow's put this together. Great director who worked on, of course, my favourite episode of The Mandalorian, which was the third episode, where we got to see the Mandalorian clan, Din Djarin, go nuts. Literally, go nuts. You know, if you want Mandalorians with jetpacks and flamethrowers and Gatling guns, you got it, folks. You even got John Favreau in there, too. The second character he's played, I think, is Star Wars. Uh, and that mission is to give you the entertainment you deserve, folks. So when the show opens up, we get to see Obi-Wan is, we've got a job as a butcher. You know, if you want your lamb chops, who do you see? You see Ben Kenobi, because Ben Kenobi's just chilling out there, chopping away and getting his little pittance of food back afterwards. And, of course, then he goes and lives in a cave. That apparently Bail Organa knows where it is. <laughs> we'll get to that in a sec, folks. 
In the meantime, he takes his Yopi for a little bit of a ride. And, of course, he's watching from the distance and sees Luke Skywalker as a kid running around, stupid around the Lars homestead. In the middle of all that, of course, he's worried that these Inquisitors, after, of course, Force uses it around course kenobi himself too they know kenobi's out there and he is the white whale as you would say in moby dick terms and that's basically what they're after they're after the the big masters no doubt they've taken out a few before as we get through the episode the big thing that we find out that reaver is after is of course the ambitiousness of taking out kenobi herself and in doing so becoming grand inquisitor second only to leading the formation under darth vader so we don't really see Vader in this episode. We get to see more of what he's doing on Tatooine. Kenobi's pretty much trying to lay as low uh, as he can. In town, they get to see a Jedi being chased around. This Jedi is being hunted by three of the Inquisitors at that stage. What's interesting about these scenes is we get to see Kenobi's strength in reluctance to throw in the heroic uh, struggle that he usually does as a Jedi so that he keeps Luke safe. He is poked and prodded by a different source as we head towards the end of the episode and into the second, where we go to Alderaan. And we, of course, see Jimmy Smith's back. There's Bail Organa again, and we get to see he and his wife as well, and Princess Leia. It is a young curry in all but name. The actress playing Princess Leia in this has all the, the spark and spunk of Princess Leia that we've seen in all material before. And, of course, that rebellious, intelligent nature of the character uh, that really defines what Carrie made so strong. This is where some of Kenobi, for me, wears thin. What this is, is we get to see Michael Balsery, Red Hot Chili Peppers Michael Balsery in this episode, kidnap Princess Leia. Part of this is that she's being taken because she's going to be bait in Kenobi to basically come out and get caught. Leia is taken to another planet, which looks like Blade Runnerville. It's the only way I can describe it. It does look like that. It, it's certainly got a tinge of Blade Runner about it. But then Jimmy Smits try and track down Kenobi himself, get him in on the mission. Of course, Kenobi says, I can't leave. You know, I'm chilling out here in this cave, eating my dried meat. And what am I going to do? Well, I have to stay here and look after the last homestead, make sure old Luke is all good. Jimmy says, you know what, I'm going to turn up anyway. And so he turns up in the cave. Uh, this is when Kenobi's pushed to go and hunt down Lair and get her to safety. Hey, this is Daniel Jose Older, and you are listening to Fanta Tracks. Disney Plus, biggest show up until then was The Mandalorian. But Mandalorian is the original show. And I do believe, from what I've seen of it anyway, Ewan McGregor was definitely influenced by that show in his decision to come back and play Kenobi. What is the main thrust of The Mandalorian? The Mandalorian is simply this. It is Lone Wolf and Cub. Same feeling. But, of course, The Mandalorian is the wolf and Grogu is the cub. Well, this is pretty much Kenobi, Lone Wolf and Cub. You know, we've got the same idea is the fact that, of course, there's people hunting down the quarry. Of course, that is Princess Leia. Although, you, some would say they're actually hunting down Kenobi as well, but maybe she's the bait this time it's the other way around but it is the same premise is that we have an old uh, warrior character and then we have a young force powered individual grogu princess leia young force powered individual and you know what it bloody well worked it hasn't really dawned on me just how good this series ha goes when it comes to um, really taking what mandalorian does well and then just really expanding upon that formula uh, it definitely, I think, better than uh, The Book of Boba Fett, which I did enjoy. I, I really did think The Book of Boba Fett was an interesting uh, way of looking at things because there's definitely that sort of godfather-like feel to it, Goodfellas. You know, there's all those sort of gangster parts in that and a bit of a Western as well. This is different, you know, and, and what's interesting is, is the element of a character, which is something that Star Wars is all about, which is Darth Vader. You can say the sequel trilogy is not about Darth Vader. Well, it kind of is. <laughs> all of it's about Darth Vader, but it's also all about the legacy of characters like Darth Vader. So to bring Darth Vader into this, and particularly 10 years in where he's been leading forces in the Empire, and he's been Sheev Palpatine's number one bad boy, then obviously there's going to be something interesting about where that heads. To give the chance of Hayden coming back and playing the character in these scenes in the suit, third episode... Obi-Wan already on the run with Princess Leia, and of course the Inquisitors have tracked him down, and in tracking him down, in comes Vader, and just the lenses that were used by the, you know, the cinematographer, the way that Deborah has um, really brought about the style 
of the fight. This one was really showing, you know, a Jedi that hasn't been practicing. You know, Obi-Wan is as rusty as he is. He's been using more a blaster than he has a lightsaber. But the lightsaber's been out in the desert, you know, sunk in the ground. He's a rusty old lightsaber. In comparison to somebody like Vader, who has had really no Jedi to go up against. No real adversary that's going to test him. So when you get to see him in the desert on that planet fighting, you know, it's absolute machine of a man. And that, that really lives up to exactly what Obi-Wan says in the original trilogy. He's more machine now than man. Well, he is. He's fighting like a machine. A lot of those strikes, there's no real human-like strike like that that's going to work unless the character is robotic and more like a Terminator, which Vader is. You know, what little left of humanity Anakin had, you know, there's not much of it in there and we get to see that in the back to tank, which is another interesting angle. Obviously, through this fight, we get to see the absolute reverse of what happened in Revenge of the Sith. The higher ground is something that Vader gets in this, but he also gets to see his old master in... Basically, what he was in 10 years before, he's in flames. And, of course, you know, it gets pretty badly burnt. You know, at the end of the episode, we get to see Kenobi get away to safety. In doing that, he also gets to be thrown in Bacta. Part of that healing, too, is we get to see it juxtaposed, of course, with uh, Vader himself, healing him up and keeping him alive. A little bit of humanity he has inside the tank, you know. Otherwise, he's in that massive, massive, huge, dry lung we call, of course, the Vader suit. For everything in one location... Daily news, reviews, interviews, podcasts, video and social media feeds. Bookmark Fanthatracks.com for Star Wars news 24-7, 365. Hayden may not have gotten, you know, obviously a lot of scenes. We're promised a great scene later and we do get it. The fifth episode's just aired, and um, although I didn't think the fourth episode was all that interesting, this fifth one has knocked it out of the park. We open in a scene that's pre-Attack of the Clones on Coruscant, and we have Hayden, along with Ewan, with his Jedi mullet and everything. Certainly better than the fake beard that we see in Attack of the Clones in the pickup scenes, folks, on Kamino, and of course in the Jedi Temple. Yes, George, I'm looking at you, buddy. You know, And what's great about these scenes... Again, we get to see, or in this case, at this stage, you know, they're definitely Master Apprentice. We get to see them playing out their strengths, both of them. Part of what we get to see is Obi-Wan Kenobi really using his mind, you know, and really starting to think like we get to see him later in this, this series anyway. Kenobi and, of course, um, Anakin fight. You can see those Nick like swishes and swooshes with the saber. What I do like about whoever did the choreography on this is that they're not just standing still like they did in some of the scenes in Phantom Menace and of course in some of those in uh, the Attack of the Clones ones. I'm not the biggest fan of the choreography on the prequels. No one stands still. No one does. No one fighting does. Even hand to hand, you are going to be moving constantly. If you stand there, you're going to get pummeled. And unfortunately, there's just some scenes where, you know, they're waiting to get the next hit in. It wasn't so much like that in the original series. And uh, I think they've learned to a certain extent on the sequels not to do that too. It comes down to it, the work done by Nick Gillard at least got the flurry of force users, or in this case, martial artists with lightsabers into the picture. Because, you know, Jedi had become complacent anyway. There was no real threat to them. And there certainly was a sense of there's never going to be anything that's going to stretch their abilities. Of course, that wasn't true. You know, they really need to look at some of the, some of the great YouTube stuff that's out there now, even uh, by fans and experienced sword fighters, folks, um, that can really show you the, the chess game. Because it is a chess game. It doesn't matter what style you do. But getting back to it, they do move around quite a bit more. It's not static. Hi, this is Julie Dolan, the voice of Princess Leia. And you're listening to Fanthatrax. It's your only hope. From there, we get into the episode. Of course, they're on the hunt from Vader straight away. Reaver, of course, is given a chance to be the Grand Inquisitor, which is kind of starting to complete her story. Part of that, we get to see a flashback in, um, of course, the Jedi Temple, Order 66. And if anything, this episode is the strongest because we really get to see Hayden be terrifying. You're actually quite scared of Vader by this stage. You know, we get to see him going through um, the lobbies and stuff like that of the Jedi Temple, just hacking away. Jedi kids, the younglings, are just like trees or something like that. He's a lumberjack. How does somebody break that 
badly. And that's part of what we're going to see of Hayden, you know, just um, really bring that ferocity, which we saw tinges of in, of course, Attack of the Clones when he took on the Tuscan camp. But this is a lot darker. By the end of this, Reva gets a chance to do something that Kenobi hints to when they're cornered and Kenobi realizes he has to give himself up. Otherwise, these guys aren't getting away and that Leia won't get a chance to be free. I knew you were one of the younglings and I knew you had faced Vader and I know why you are. That's exactly what the, you know, she's been trying to do the whole time. At the heart of it, Kenobi can see right through her, through her plan. And of course, in case in that, she tries to attack Vader and Vader. Oh, he does what Vader does best. Puts her down and he's going to take her out, but stabs her through the stomach. And of course, she goes to the ground. Part of this is that we also see the actual Grand Inquisitor turn up at the end. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the Grand Inquisitor dying in the first episode of the series and the fact that there's no way that could happen because he shows up in Rebels, folks, which is further down the timeline. So we knew he was going to be coming back, but when? Kenobi is going to somehow get out of all of this. And of course, we've got to have a big showdown with Vader. It's meant to be the rematch of the century as it's been billed by everyone from StarWars.com all the way on. And even Hayden and Ewan themselves. So we have all that. We have to have more Luke. Certainly going to be going back to Tatooine. I mean, you've got to go back to Tatooine. Reva's story needs to have a satisfying end. I don't think she's going to die. I think there's, you know, without, without a doubt, they're talking a second series. So I'd say she's definitely going to be around. Will she be an Inquisitor? No, I think she's going to be basically a Jedi. Try and be Kenobi's new apprentice. I mean, where, where is this going to end for her? Kenobi needs to somehow keep a low profile. I mean, everyone's going out after Kenobi now. I love this, but I also love, too, some of the lore that we're starting to see explored. The Inquisitors, Inquisitors base as well, where we get to see uh, down below all these stasis chambers of Jedi Knights that have been captured, lightsabers that you're on display as well. You can see that they're, they're not really dead. They're alive, but they're kept in um, a certain stasis and this stasis is to drain them of their force essence i guess so like uh the second season of mandalorian we get starting to see something that palpatine's putting out there and you know why is he putting these sorts of things together is it to find out a way to be immortal the dark side is going to find a way and part of that is finding the right force potential so i do believe part of this is that you know he doesn't kill all the jedi and the purge he finds unique ones with high midichlorian counts and drain them of their force essence thanks for listening to the phantom from down under if you want to be a part of the action to stay updated on all the latest star wars news visit phantatracks.com or check out the free phantom tracks app through the app store to follow us on your mobile device. You can reach out to us and send in your listeners' questions by emailing radio at fanthatracks.com. You can also find me over at Fandom Podcast Network where I host The Lethal Mullet, Making Tracks with Mark Newbold, and Mullet and Kilt with Greg Robertson. That's right, Darth Elvis. And you can find me on Twitter at The Lethal Mullet. You can comment, like, share any of our social media feeds at Fanthatracks. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, preferably a five-star one on Amazon Music, Audible, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your podcatcher of choice. And as always, thanks to James Semple for composing the Fanta Tracks intro and Mark Daniel and of course Vanessa Marshall for our voiceovers. Remember to tune in to our Fanta Tracks news show, Good Morning Tatooine, live Sunday evenings at 9 pm UK, 4 pm Eastern, and 1 pm Pacific on Facebook and YouTube. This is Star Wars News in a single file. May the force be with you. Coming up next on Fanta Tracks Radio, it's Making Tracks.